Vision Core presents speaker series, Mac Energy Generation, What to Expect, Timeline, Stages, and more. We're very excited to have all of you with us today. Before we jump into the presentation, um, I just want to again remind everyone that we're going to keep everyone's mics on mute. Um, if you're able to turn your camera off, that will be fine. Um, and again, uh, during the Q&A portion uh, following the presentation, we'll let everyone know how to unmute yourself um, if you have a question. Um, so. Again, before we quickly jump into uh, the presentation, um, I just wanted to review a little bit uh, briefly about Vision Core. Uh, Vision Core's rehabilitation services don't just involve uh, wonderful presentations like this. We also have a number of other um, rehabilitation services. So whether you are not yet working with us, or you have been working with us for some time, but maybe new needs or goals have come up, we encourage you to reach out to your local case manager um, and um, talk with us further about some of our services that include low vision occupational therapy um, for daily living skills instruction, as well as orientation and mobility instruction, which includes things such as safe travel, white cane instruction, um, crossing streets, um, just many different areas um, in that subject. We also have access technology instruction for folks who are interested to learn how to better use the technology they have or to learn about helpful technology that's out there to make life easier now that you have a, a low vision, a condition, or are blind. We also have a number of um, education and support groups and uh, again, we encourage you to reach out to us about your needs and goals that you have so we can connect you with the right resources within and outside of Vision Core. So now I want to introduce our wonderful speaker today um, who's back for a second time, uh, Dr. Dina Gawaley. She's an experienced retinal surgeon at Lancaster Retina Specialists. She completed her ophthalmology residency at the University of Pennsylvania's prestigious Shea Eye Institute. And at Penn, she was a member of the surgical retina team that developed the first FDA approved gene therapy in the United States for an inherited disease. So um, Dr. Guela, if you're ready, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Greth, mm -hmm. and uh, thanks uh, Vision Core once again for having me. Um, it's always a nice speaking with you, and um, I appreciate the invitation. And of course, um, Lancaster Retina Specialists, we really appreciate all that you do for our patients. So thank you once again. So I was asked to speak about uh, this time is what a patient can expect to experience in each stage and then to specifically discuss a condition called Charles Binet syndrome. Uh, and then at the end of the talk, uh, I'll try to answer 10 common questions that are asked by uh, clients in Vision Core. And, um, and then at the end, if you have further questions, I'd be happy to answer them. So let me just uh, very briefly give an introduction on AMD. Uh, AMD stands for age-related macular degeneration. It also goes by ARMD. There are many different types of macular degeneration, but I'm going to focus on the most common type, which is the age-related type. So what exactly is the retina? It's the very back lining of the eye. I refer to it as the film of the camera. The macula is specifically the center of the retina, and then the center of the macula is known as the fovea. And it'll be clear later on why I'm getting so specific, because when I discuss the stages of AMD, okay. I'll just refer to age-related macular degeneration as AMD going forward. Uh, you'll understand what uh, I'll make references to, to these uh, terms, and I'll repeat them uh, you know, again. So AMD is the leading cause of vision loss in Americans over the age of 50. When you get to the age of 65, one out of 100 or 1% 1 of all Americans will have some form of AMD. The older you get, the more likely you are to have AMD. So by the age of 80, 12 out of 100 Americans will have some form of AMD. And with the longer life expectancies, we can expect to see more AMD. 
the vast majority of people with AMD have the dry form. That leaves 10 to 20% with the wet AMD. Wet comes from the dry form. So everyone starts off dry, and then a certain proportion of patients switch over to wet. The difference between the two is in dry AMD, the retina gets thinner with age and develops these waste deposits that we call drusen. And they, they accumulate under the retina and the retina becomes thinner. And that's the, what leads to the vision loss in dry AMD. Wet AMD, as indicated by the name, has some fluid, it involves fluid. So uh, fluid accumulates either under the retina or in the retina, and then that leads to visual changes. In addition to fluid, there may be some blood or cholesterol leakage as well. And if left untreated, wet AMD can cause permanent scarring. So these are the two types of age-related macular disease, the dry and the wet. So I get asked often, which is better to have, dry or wet? And it really depends on the stage of, of the condition. So I would argue that a very early stage of wet is better to have than an advanced stage of dry. And I will get into the specifics of the stages. Um, that is a topic of the discussion, the stages of AMD and then the vision changes that occur in each stage. With the wet AMD, it's always better to diagnose and treat early. And, um, and that's why it's important to go for regular eye exams because uh, one can have AMD and not realize it until it's a little advanced. In general, wet AMD can progress more quickly than dry. And, um, you know, and, and, and that's just a generality, but I'll, I'll go into the specifics. AMD is considered advanced AMD, even if it's a very mild case of wet. So the earliest cases of wet AMD, believe it or not, can be asymptomatic. So the patient may have um, no symptoms whatsoever, and it could just be an incidental finding. However, we still typically treat with injections, even if the patient is completely asymptomatic, because we don't want the fluid to get worse and then lead to worse symptoms and potentially scarring. Once we get to the scarring stage of AMD, we, we can't unfortunately go back. So scarring at this point cannot be cured. Most wet AMD, however, does present with symptoms. The common term we, uh, we use is metamorphopsia. That is a fancy word for wavy lines. So lines that should be nice and straight start to have a bend to them. And that is um, by far the most common symptom experienced by patients who have wet AMD. That's why it's very important that patients have what we call an Amsler grid at home. And it's a very simple, grid, um, uh, black lines on a white background with a black dot in the center. And the way you use this grid is by holding it at reading distance with your reading glasses on in a well-lit environment. And it's very important that you test each eye separately. So you close the left eye, test the right, vice versa. The lines should be nice and straight. If one day you notice a curve to one of the lines or a blind spot or something's a little different, it's important to contact your eye doctor promptly within a day or two um, because this is the most common symptom of wet AMD. Advanced wet AMD presents with loss of central vision and this is typically Again, to recap, all wet AMD is considered advanced, but wet AMD can be broken down into early um, majority of cases and then more advanced cases. Dry AMD, on the other hand, is uh, divided into early dry AMD, intermediate dry AMD, and advanced dry AMD. When a patient has no AMD, 
they are naturally uh, asymptomatic, no symptoms. So it is normal to have a few drusen or age spots in the back of the eye. If it's just a few mild drusen, the patient may not even be considered to have AMD. However, when those small drusen start to accumulate in greater numbers, or if there are some medium-sized drusen, then we, we say that the patient has early dry AMD. Now, of course, this is not something that the patient would know by his or herself. It's, it's diagnosed with the eye exam. Most people with early dry AMD are still asymptomatic. Moving on to intermediate dry AMD, this is when we find on exam many medium-sized drusen or even large-sized drusen. Um, at this point, patients tend to have some symptoms. While some may be asymptomatic, uh, others may say that they have some mild vision distortion. I've had patients use uh, the term a blip. Just something's a little off. When they look at the grid, there's a little abnormality. Um, but it tends to not come on suddenly. A dry AMD tends to progress a little more slowly. They may not be able to correct to 2020. So someone with intermediate dry AMD may be one, two lines off from 20. Of intermediate dry AMD is just a little bit of trouble with contrast sensitivity. Uh, and another um, issue commonly encountered would be uh, that the patient requires more light to perform normal tasks. So reading would be a very common task in which the patient realizes he or she needs more light or while knitting, especially close up work, they need to increase the light in the room. So this is a pretty common uh, symptom of intermediate dry AMD. When we get to the advanced stage of dry AMD, we have what we call geographic atrophy or GA. What this means is that there's some loss of retina tissue because the retina has become thin to the point where now we have islands of geographic atrophy. Um, this is considered advanced dry. At this point, the patient will likely have some symptoms. Again, it's important to close each eye separately in order to isolate the problem because really good vision in one eye may mask uh, a, a problem in the other eye. And the most common symptom of geographic atrophy is uh, what we call a scotoma or a blind spot. Um, when it comes to um, the effect on vision, the larger the area of the atrophy or the closer the atrophy is to the center, the more likely the patient's vision is going to be affected. Now, the idea of geographic atrophy is important because, and I'll get into this a little bit later in the talk, we now have two treatments for geographic atrophy as of 2023. Before then, we had no treatment for dry AMD. So regardless of whether the patient has dry or wet AMD, generally it's the central vision that is affected. Um, again, the macula is what's affected in this. So examples of what a patient may experience if the AMD is advanced enough is if uh, a patient is looking at a clock, um, he or she uh, may be able to see the numbers on the edges of the clock, but have trouble seeing the hands of the clock. Or if they're looking at a, a person's face, they may have trouble seeing parts of the face. Again, this is in the more advanced AMD, whether that's dry or wet. The good thing, the reassuring thing, is that generally the, the side vision or the peripheral vision remains intact in AMD. So hopefully the patient will never go completely blind from this condition unless the AMD is unusual and that it's extremely aggressive or not caught early enough, or if the patient has another problem on top of the AMD, such as glaucoma, for instance. Um, so uh, basically that's what I have to say about these stages of AMD. 
So um, all wet AMD is considered advanced, but there's different stages depending on how early it's caught. And then the dry AMD, which is what most people have, is divided into early, intermediate, and advanced. It's very important that anyone 65 and up is going for regular eye exams, whether that's with the optometrist or the ophthalmologist, every one to two years, even if the eye exam is completely normal, because you want to have this condition diagnosed as early as possible so that you know to monitor with a grid and you know what symptoms to look out for. Okay. Um, okay, moving on. Now I have uh, quite a bit to say about Uh, doctor, I'm Do sorry, Dr. Uh, Gawali, you're muted. Yes, I mu muted you on by accident. Okay, Stop. there you go. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> no problem. Well, okay. actually, this is a good uh, point to um, to hold for a second. Does does that all make sense, or should we leave question and answer to the very end? Yeah, we could do that at the end. I think that would be great. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So then I'll move <clears> on and <throat> talk about Charles Binet syndrome. Perfect. So, um, uh, and before I go in too much about this, I want to make sure to cite my sources. I did use iWikipedia as a source, the American Academy of Ophthalmology, and some other journal articles. So, I wanted to uh, just start off with that. So, Charles Binet syndrome is a um, condition that was actually uh, discovered years and years ago in the year 1760 by a Swiss scientist who noticed. Um, that his 87-year-old grandfather was starting to have hallucinations. And um, his grandfather didn't have hallucinations due to an underlying brain or neurologic condition, but rather because his grandfather was blind due to cataracts. So uh, this condition is, is interesting in that there's no clear diagnostic criteria, but what the Swiss scientists noticed were three main characteristics. So the patient has hallucinations, and these are visual hallucinations, not that the patient is hearing things, but rather the patient is seeing things. The patient has advanced eye disease, and the hallucinations are not due to a neurologic condition. So it's not a psychiatric condition, it's due to an eye problem. So these are the three characteristics of Charles Binet syndrome. While it tends to occur in the elderly with advanced vision loss, it can occur in younger individuals, especially if um, he or she loses the vision suddenly. However, something interesting that I came across in my reading, and I, I didn't know this myself, is that um, those who are born blind or who are blind at a very young age, Average age of those affected with Charles Binet syndrome is probably around 80, you know, somewhere between age 70 and 85. Um, and, and part of that is because this condition occurs in people with advanced vision loss. So while Charles Binet's grandfather had um, had the condition due to cataracts, the most common cause at this time would be AMD. Uh, because, of course, we have a cure for cataracts. It's cataract surgery, and most people don't wait until they start to develop hallucinations in order to go for cataract surgery. Other risk factors of Charles Binet, um, in addition to being older and having advanced vision loss, is social isolation. So, um, and we're not entirely sure why that is, but these are just risk factors that are associated with this condition. We really don't know how common this condition is. So in my literature search, I saw uh, prevalence rates of 0.5%, so one out of 200, all the way up to 39%, so uh, almost 40% of people having Charles Binet. And the reason why no one really knows how common this condition is is because I think people are not aware of this condition. It's underreported. There's also a bit of a stigma associated with this condition. Uh, I think patients are, are somewhat afraid to bring up to their eye care provider or their family doctor that he or she is hallucinating. Uh, maybe that's due to fear of uh, being labeled as having a psychiatric problem, 
but really it's important to emphasize that this condition is due to uh, a vision problem. It's an, uh, it's an ophthalmology condition, it's not a neurologic condition. Uh, there was a study based on the AREDS2 study, um, which estimated that 12% of people with AMD actually have experienced Charles Binet syndrome. So again, a very wide uh, numbers that we're getting. And is bothering the patient, there potentially are some ways to treat it. So how is Charles Binet, how does it present? The, the primary uh, presentation is hallucinations, as I mentioned, visual hallucinations that can either be simple or complex. Simple meaning just perhaps a flash of light or a pattern, squares, zigzags, uh, something uh, pretty straightforward. But a, a lot of people I would say present with the complex hallucinations. They may see people, they may see objects, they may see scenery. In my experience, I have many patients who tell me they see flowers. Um, the hallucinations can last seconds, minutes, hours, even days at a time. And the hallucinations may move or they may stay stationary. In terms of the timing of the hallucinations, there's three general categories. Either they're episodic, periodic, or continuous. Episodic means they occur in one episode and then the hallucinations may stop permanently. However, that episode may last days, weeks, or months. Hallucinations can also be periodic, meaning they, they can occur for a period of time and then remit and then recur again. Or in the, the last category, they may be continuous with no breaks whatsoever. And if the hallucinations are frightening, this can really upset the patient, uh, maybe even lead to depression. Um, the, what causes these hallucinations can vary um, per individual. So sometimes there, are, there is a clear trigger. So it, it can be brought on by stress, uh, fatigue, Certain lighting conditions can bring on these hallucinations, dim lighting conditions. Um, they, they will occur when the patient is awake. And because the patient's neurologic function is intact, meaning their brain is normal, the patient not real. It doesn't make it any, you know, any more um, comforting to patients because they can be pretty upset about these hallucinations. However, the good news is most hallucinations will eventually stop after a couple of years. So uh, Charles Binet um, can be pretty bothersome for people for about two or three years, and then generally they do get better with time. The other good thing to note about this condition is that it actually uh, does not affect a patient's lifespan. It's not like dementia in which uh, the, life, the patient's lifespan is cut short based on this. Patients live a normal lifespan with these hallucinations. No one really knows exactly what causes Charles Binet. Um, the most simple explanation is that because the patient is uh, visually impaired, has severe vision loss, the, br the brain doesn't get any stimulation from the environment. So generally what happens is, of course, our eyes see, you know, the world around us. Then that information gets transferred to the brain by way of the optic nerve. So the nerve is like a cable that connects the brain to the eye. That information goes to the back of the brain, uh, the visual cortex, and then it's processed. However, in people with advanced vision loss, uh, there is no information going from the outside world to the brain. So the brain comes up with its own um, visual ag activity, so to speak, or hallucinations in order to fill the gap. This is the most common explanation for why people develop Charles Binet. The, so now let's talk about the treatment of Charles Binet. If at all possible, you, you treat the underlying condition. So as I mentioned in the past, cataracts may have been the most common cause of Charles Binet. And now the solution is very simple. You undergo cataract surgery. The most common cause of Charles Binet is thought to be AMD. Injections and hopefully we get the vision to improve. Um, 
However, we know that we can't treat all forms of AMD, especially when it gets to a certain stage. So uh, if that's the case, uh, then we have to look at other uh, ways to manage this condition. First off, it's, it is a condition, a diagnosis of exclusion. So what I always tell patients who, who tell me that they're having hallucinations is, of course, let your family doctor know, the geriatric physician, the, intern, the internist. Make sure that nothing else is going on, that the patient hasn't changed medications recently, that there's no early dementia, you know, God forbid, a brain tumor, something else leading to the hallucinations. If everything is ruled out, uh, then we, we could assume it's the advanced vision loss that's leading to the Charles Binet. The mainstay of treatment is actually non-medical, and I'll go into that momentarily. But there are uh, four classes of medications that could potentially uh, be used to manage Charles Binet. However, there is no single medication to treat this condition. It really is trial and error. I would have to say, though, interestingly enough, of all my patients with Charles Binet, um, I don't know of any of them who are on medication. Usually, it's it's the non-medical treatment. The four classes would be antipsychotics. So, again, this is not a condition of psychosis, but what people have found is that certain types of antipsychotics may help in decreasing the hallucinations. Another class of medications would be the seizure medications. For instance, a drug called Keppra may help in reducing the hallucinations from Charles Binet. There's also a class of medications um, that are used to treat Alzheimer's dementia called the cholinesterase inhibitors. Um, some people have found some relief with these medications. And lastly, and though we know this isn't primarily uh, a depression that we're treating, uh, but that class of medications may help. So these are the four classes of medications that are sometimes used for Charles Binet. However, as I mentioned, the primary management of this condition is non-medical. So what can we do to try to help reduce these hallucinations? The first thing I would say is to, um, the patient should try to identify what are the triggers. So if it happens when he or she is tired, then try to get better rest. Since social isolation is thought to be a risk factor for Charles Binet, um, try to surround yourself with um, with people throughout the day. Try, you know, uh, go out with groups, uh, join low vision groups. You know, um, you know, try your best to spend time with family to reduce the social isolation, which can exacerbate this condition. Some people will develop the hallucinations in low lighting, so then you increase the lighting. So it could be simple things like that. Uh, another technique that I read about, which I thought was interesting, is if if and when you notice the hallucination, you should look at the hallucination and then without moving your head, look away. And you do that several times, uh, about 15 times quickly. So you just, with your eyes, you look at the hallucination, then you look away, then you look at the hallucination without moving your head while blinking several times. Some people have reported relief. Another approach is to actually look straight at the hallucination and actually try to reach for the hallucination while blinking quickly for seconds, and that may help certain people. Um, you could also just change your environment altogether. So if you're in a room and the hallucination starts to come, they say just get up, move to another room, do something else, distract yourself, and that may actually help. Other people uh, report relief uh, with therapy or even hypnosis. Talk to someone about your condition because really just empathy and reassurance is what the vast majority of people benefit from. So just realizing that this isn't early dementia, this isn't psychosis, this isn't extreme depression, this is a, uh, due to your advanced vision loss, it's usually enough for most people. And this is also what I gather um, just from talking from uh, to my patients is that once they realize that these hallucinations are, are not real and that um, what's causing them and that more than likely it will get better with time, that most people are, are okay with it and, and they, and they um, get by. 
Okay, so that's what I had to say about Charles Binet. So at this point, I wanted to spend time uh, talking about the uh, question and answer. So I was given 10 uh, very interesting questions from Vision Core clients, and so I will take my time in answering each of these questions. The first question I think we've addressed, and that is, what is Charles Binet syndrome and what can I do if I have it? So I, tr I, I tried to do my best in outlining that for all of you. Question two, will I go blind from AMD? So AMD, as I mentioned, stands for age-related macular degeneration, which, which indicates that this is a degenerative condition. However, in my clinical practice, I like to call it age-related macular disease, because I think now with the current treatments that we have, we can uh, prevent many people from going blind. I think the treatment has gotten much, much better you know, before the injections, uh, which uh, we call the VEGF inhibitors, how we treat wet AMD, all the only options that were available to patients were laser in the form of uh, what we call thermal laser or PDT, photodynamic therapy. So when those were the only options, Ever since around 2005, we've, uh, we have many injections now that we give patients uh, for wet AMD, and we can prevent many people from going blind now. So as I alluded to earlier in my talk, very few people go completely blind from AMD. Because AMD affects the central retina, uh, hopefully it's just going to be some changes in the center vision, and you will always maintain your peripheral vision, which will hopefully be good enough to, to do many of the things you need to do. So to answer, will I go blind from AMD? Hopefully not. You have a much better chance now of not going blind from AMD than um, you know 25 years ago. And we have hopefully more, more treatments in the pipeline. And uh, the big thing really, the treatments we have work very well, especially for wet AMD. Now the focus is on just getting the treatments to last longer. So if we could get to that point, um, then hopefully patients will be will be happier. Okay, question three, are AREDS2 or Preservision vitamins beneficial and should I take them? So the answer is probably yes, if you have dry intermediate AMD. So the AREDS2, are indicated for the dry AMD. So as I mentioned, there's wet AMD and there's dry AMD. And specifically for those with the intermediate dry AMD. So there's no, at least to my knowledge, there's no evidence to suggest that those without AMD or with very, very mild AMD should be taking the AREDS too. However, I have many patients, whether it's because of a strong family history or they have some mild changes, choose to take AREDS too. And if that's the case, I don't stop them. And it doesn't necessarily have to be Preservision. Preservision is just one specific brand of AREDS2. There are lots of brands out there, such as Occuvite or Focus. I pretty much leave it up to the patient. What is exactly the benefit of AREDS2 vitamins? A big study known as AREDS2 showed that there may be a 25% slowing down of intermediate dry AMD to advanced dry AMD at five years in those patients who take the AREDS2 vitamins. So uh, no vitamin can um, possibly be a cure or completely prevent a condition, but if we could slow the progress down, it's, it's better than nothing. And interestingly enough, uh, research out of the National Eye Institute that just came out June of this year shows some possible benefit of the AREDS2 vitamins uh, amongst patients with the advanced dry AMD. So if you recall, advanced dry AMD are those patients with the geographic atrophy or missing tissue. So um, there is some evidence that perhaps there is a slowing down of the GA, the geographic atrophy lesions in those who take the AREDS2. So in other words, it, it doesn't hurt uh, to take AREDS2 if you have intermediate or advanced dry AMD. 
assuming that it's cleared uh, by your family doctor. I, you know, a lot of my patients are on many medications, blood thinners and chemotherapy and so on and so forth. So uh, any vitamin or drug can interact with those medications. So once you get the clearance from your family doctor, uh, then I say go ahead and take it. What exactly is AREDS2? It's a vitamin that consists of several components, so specifically 500 milligrams of vitamin C, 400 IU or international units of vitamin E, 10 milligrams of lutein, 2 milligrams of zeaxanthine, and 80 milligrams of zinc oxide. It also includes 2 milligrams of copper oxide, but the primary um, uh, purpose of the copper oxide is just to prevent a zinc induced and is meant to be taken in addition to your multivitamin. The most most people tolerate a ARIDS 2 vitamins just fine. However, the most common side effect is stomach upset. So it's good to take the ARIDS 2 with uh, your meals. So one uh, pill in the morning with food and then one pill in the evening with food. So that, that's what I have to say about ARIDS-2 vitamins. Okay, question number four uh, was an excellent question. And that is what lifestyle changes can I make to slow down the progression of AMD? This is an excellent question, especially um, the, because of the longer life expectancy and uh, we wanna try to slow down the progression of AMD. Uh, I would say the answer, number one, number two, and number three to that question would be do not smoke. Smoking is by far the biggest and most modifiable risk factor for the progression of AMD. Even secondhand smoke is bad for you, meaning people around you who smoke in your household. The reason being smoking increases inflammation in our body and we know about all the bad side effects of smoking, the retina is no exception. So, um, so that is probably the most important lifestyle change you can make. And if you quit smoking, great, don't start. Uh, smoking, in addition to increasing inflammation in the body, causes uh, what we call oxidative damage, meaning it literally kills off the cells and causes aging of the cells in our body. The other thing I tell patients is what's good for the heart is good for the retina. So that means having a healthy diet, having a healthy lifestyle, exercise, so on and so forth. Specific diet that is recommended in order to slow down AMD progression is the Mediterranean diet. Again, any major diet change you wanna run by your family doctor uh, because which can interact with blood thinners. So uh, again, just make sure you get that medical clearance. Uh, but the more green, red, orange vegetables you eat is generally thought to be better for your retina. Specifically, kale and spinach are supposed to be excellent um, for the retina. Eating fish twice a week, healthy fats and nuts. We want to try to avoid the amount of uh, red meat we eat because that can lead to the oxidative damage. So generally, food that's rich in vitamin A, C, E, lutein, zeaxanthin, uh, pretty much the components of the ARITs too. And I want to advise patients against overdosing on vitamins. It's much better uh, to get the vitamins from your diet rather than to take you know, double the ARIDS2, for instance, because you can overdose on some of these vitamins, which would not be healthy for you. In addition to smoking avoidance, having a healthy diet, um, having a healthy weight and exercise is uh, thought to be beneficial for AMD, believe it or not. The same reasons uh, that, that uh, you know, pretty much inflammation. So if you have a healthy weight, you're more likely to have less inflammation in your body. Also exercise independently decreases the inflammation in your body. The ideal uh, regimen would be if you could handle it and, it's, and your family doctor and cardiologist are okay with it, you do about 30 minutes of exercise five days a week. Other lifestyle uh, modifications or, or health modifications would be to make sure your blood pressure, cholesterol, and sugar levels are as ideally controlled as possible. Um, 
very high blood pressure or high cholesterol can make the AMD worse, progress more quickly. And the role of sunglasses, of course, it doesn't hurt to have a good pair of sunglasses as well. So um, that's what I have to say about lifestyle changes uh, in order to slow down a number five was also a very good one and I get asked this quite often in the office are my children at risk of inheriting or developing AMD so uh, definitely there is a genetic component to AMD however that's still being studied so there's no single AMD gene we are not at the point where we could run a blood study or a swab of the mouth and say okay you're positive for the AMD gene, you will get AMD by this age. Nothing like that is available at this time. Current uh, studies sh show that there could be as many as 30 genes or more that are associated with AMD. However, the interaction between these genes and the environment still needs to be studied. So at this point, the American Academy of Ophthalmology does not recommend routine genetic screening. And while studies are being are looking at gene therapy for the treatment of AMD, there is no such thing as gene therapy at this time. So what I tell patients is since we can't control our genes, we should at this point focus on what we can control, which is the lifestyle modifications that I discussed. And most importantly, is going for those regular eye exams. So, um, you know, age 65 and up at a minimum annual to every two year exams, even with a normal eye exam. If you have a strong family history of AMD, you may want to consider getting that thorough dilated exam at a younger age. Because really, it's the eye exam which will which will tell us uh, the likelihood of a, of a person developing AMD or being at risk for vision loss due to AMD. I've had lots of many patients who uh, have a very strong family history of AMD, yet I examine them and they have no drusen or signs of AMD whatsoever. And then I have the opposite. I have people with advanced AMD who have no family history. So there's no direct correlation. And interestingly enough, I did come across this AMD Institute web page, and uh, this is uh, coming out of KCI Institute in Washington State. And, and a lot of uh, the, the components of this calculation is based on the eye exam itself. So it's not for the average individual to just go in and pop in some variables and calculate their risk of AMD. It really depends on uh, what we see on the exam in addition to the family history and, and other factors. Okay, question number six is a big one. Uh, so we get this question a lot also in the office, which is how often would I have to get injections for AMD and are they painful? Okay, so when we talk about injections for AMD, we have to be specific. There's injections for the wet AMD. And then as of last year, there's now injections for the dry AMD. So let's first talk about the wet AMD. Wet AMD uh, injections are, are generally given every four to six weeks in the beginning. So when a patient is initially diagnosed with wet AMD, the patient undergoes what we call the loading doses. Every four weeks, four, five, six weeks, we keep at it, injection, 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 until we get the retina dry, meaning there's no active fluid in the retina, under the retina. If there was blood on the exam, the blood has resorbed and we've hit a plateau hopefully with some improvement in vision. So once we've completed those every four to six week loading doses, then we enter a maintenance phase. Uh, we cannot treat wet AMD, we're just trying to control it. So once wet, always wet, but we wanna keep it under control and prevent the fluid or blood from coming back and causing further vision loss. And there's different maintenance regimens we then pursue. So Either a patient may opt to treat as needed, meaning they come to the office on a somewhat regular basis, whether that's every four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, and we treat using our testing or if any blood comes back or signs of metamorphopsia, those wavy lines starting to come back, then we inject. I would say most retina specialists and patients choose to undergo a treat and extend approach 
once we've stabilized the retina and we've dried you know, the patient out using every six week injections, now we start to slowly extend the interval between the injections, seven weeks, eight weeks, nine weeks. Once we start to see a little bit of fluid coming back on the pictures or if the wavy lines come back or if we see any blood recur, then we cut back the interval. That's how treat and extend uh, works. And with time, we hope to be able to extend that interval further and further out because studies have showed that the, the uh, more years of treatment for wet AMD, the less injections patients typically require. So it, it's always a, a bit of trial and error in a controlled fashion. Other people may choose to be treated at a particular interval for life. And that's especially the case in my monocular patients. So if a patient has lost vision completely to wet AMD, uh, he, or she, he or she may opt to have treatments every eight weeks, every 10 weeks, every 12 weeks indefinitely for life in order to preserve the vision in their uh, only seeing eye. So that's how often we give injections for wet AMD. Now we have two injections that are FDA approved for dry AMD. These injections are called Sifovri and Isorve. Specifically, these are only to treat patients with the advanced form of dry AMD, meaning they have geographic atrophy. So those patients with early or intermediate AMD do not get any form of injections at this time. Now the Sifovri and Isorve are uh, indicated to be given every 28 to 60 days. So the FDA 28 days or every 60 days or anywhere in between. Personally, I treat the patient every other month. So every 60 days, the reason being research has shown that we have 80% of the efficacy of the medication with 50% of the side effects and of course, a less uh, treatment burden for the patient. So they're not coming twice as often. Um, now, of course, it's a matter of debate. And again, these medications are, are relatively new. So there is still some discussion in the field, what we should do and, and that sort of thing. But that's how it's given at this time. For now, this is lifelong until otherwise noted. Um, you know, and, and um, yeah, so that's what I have to say about about the injection frequency for wet AMD and for dry AMD. Are the injections painful? If done properly, no. Um, the worst part, and I always remind my patients this so that they don't get too nervous, is the betadine antiseptic, which we absolutely have to use in order to clean the eye. It's just an eye drop. It stings. Um, but, but that's what's necessary to clean the eye surface of the bacteria because we don't want to inject an eye that's not fully clean. We may introduce harmful bacteria into the eye, which can cause blindness. Of course, we want to avoid that. So the worst part about the injection is the antiseptic. Um, however, at the end of the procedure, we do a good job of rinsing the betadine out with a sterile saline solution. Again, this is not water. We don't want to get any water in the eye for the first two days after an injection, but it's a sterile solution. We make sure the patient's comfortable, and then hopefully there is no pain afterwards. What, what's commonly experienced by patients is a little bit of foreign body sensation, feels like sand is in the eye for a day or two. And then the patient is fully recovered after that. If pain is increasing after an injection, that is specialist immediately because uh, three out of 10,000 injections are complicated uh, by endophthalmitis, which is that severe infection. It's very rare, but very serious. Uh, and so it, pain should not increase. If pain is increasing, you have to notify uh, the retina specialist right away. Um, okay, so hopefully that answers that question. Okay, question number seven. We're almost done. I was given 10 questions, so we're on number seven right now. Are the injections beneficial and are they for wet or dry AMD or both? Okay, so um, let's talk about wet AMD. A as I as I already said, there, the injections have been around since 2005 for, for wet AMD. 
There's several options now on the market. So it's nice that we have so many options to choose from. The first, and all of these medications fall under the umbrella of VEGF inhibitors. So VEGF is a mouthful. It stands for vascular endothelial growth factor. Pretty much it's a hormone that's too high in eyes with wet AMD. And what all these injections do is they lower this hormone to decrease the leakage in the back of the eye. So we're not physically sucking out the fluid, but rather we're lowering these hormone levels in order to, to dry out the retina. The first drug to do this was a drug called Macugen. That's now off the market because it, it just doesn't work as well as all the other options we have. Avastin came, it was approved, I think, the very end of 2004, early 2005, and we still use it to this day, even though, ironically, it's off-label use, but it is generally the first-line treatment by most retina specialists. We also have a drug called Lucentis or Renabizumab, specifically in a 0.5 milligram dose. We have it in a lower dose to treat other eye conditions. Ilea has been around for quite some time. And that's also an option, although we don't use it as often. And then two other medications that were, were approved in the last couple of years, you probably have heard of them because there are commercials on TV for them now, is high dose ILEA and Vibismo. In addition, in addition to these medications, there now are biosimilars for Lucentis and ILEA, meaning medication that is a very similar in structure and function to Lucentis and ILEA which sometimes um, the patient's particular insurance company will require us to use because they're a little bit cheaper before we move on to other medications. Um, so, um, these medications are undoubtedly beneficial for wet AMD, without a doubt. As I said, if we see wet AMD, we treat it. Um, you know, the only circumstance in which uh, the drugs may not work is if the wet AMD was diagnosed too late and there's a big scar. At that point, I'm a little uh, more, um, you know, liberal and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just stabilize the retina and then I generally will treat as needed. We don't want the scar to get bigger, but unfortunately we cannot reverse this, the scarring stage. That's why, again, it's very important that wet AMD is diagnosed and treated early. Without treatment for wet AMD, the patient has a high risk for losing a lot of vision. So 60% of people will lose three lines of vision or more at one year if he or she chooses not to, um, to get injections for wet AMD. So definitely wet AMD injections are beneficial. I have patients, you know, above the age of 100 who come in for these injections because they want to see for the rest of their life. Um, so I, I definitely they're helpful. Now, uh, since March 2023, we now have treatment for dry AMD. These the benefit of these injections is a little bit more under de you know, debate. Uh, the retina community, I would say, is still split over how we need to we need more long term data. We have three years of data so far on these medications. Um, the good news is th that both Cyfovri and Isorve do slow down the growth of GA, geographic atrophy or tissue loss. So this is good. It's a definitely a good starting point. It's more than we've ever had before. Uh, before March 2023, we had really very little to offer patients with dry AMD. So, so that is the good news. The benefit, however, to vision is still yet to be determined. So at three years, there is no clear evidence to suggest that those patients getting these injections every 28 days or every 60 days have better vision compared to those GA dry AMD patients who do not get the medication. So that is a bit of a disappointment to some patients and a deterrent for some. However, we still are waiting for four-year data, five-year data, six-year data. It is possible that long-term, people who do get these drugs will have better vision compared to those who don't get the medication. Um, you know, there is some uh, suggestion that uh, a test called microperimetry, which is a very sensitive test uh, to determine the sensitivity of the retina, how well it's functioning, may have better results at three years in those patients who get the dry AMD injections versus those who don't. 
So we're still waiting for more research. Again, it, it, most retina specialists will say it's better than nothing. At least we're making some strides in the treatment of dry AMD. This is very important because as I mentioned, most people have dry AMD, 80 to 90% suffer from dry. Okay. All right, so question number eight. How is macular degeneration connected to geographic atrophy? Um, you know, I, I alluded is uh, stands for geographic atrophy. It represents loss of retinal tissue. It's considered the end stage of dry AMD. However, people with wet AMD can also have areas of geographic atrophy in their retina as well. So it can be found in wet or dry, but any presence of GA is considered advanced AMD. It tends to present as blind spots or uh, what we call scotomas. The reason why I mentioned the fovea, which if you recall is the center of the macula, is because this is how we classify GA. So GA is either considered subfoveal, meaning right in the center, or extrafoveal. It's better to have, if you're going to have any form of GA, it's better to have extrafoveal GA, meaning it's not right in the center. However, um, you know, GA does spread with time in, in different rates, at different rates in different people. So there are people who have very, very slowly progressive GA. Then you have the average uh, GA patients. And then you have those who, for whatever reason, their GA progresses very quickly. And, uh, you know, I do take this into account, actually, the rate of GA growth in, in determining who should get Cyphovery and, and Isorve. If you have a patient whose GA has remained stable for years, and, you know, the patient's 90 years old, and they have excellent vision in one eye, I'm not going to recommend any GA injections. However, if you have a patient who's lost vision to GA in one eye and only has a little, you know, has good vision, but GA is threatening their vision in their only eye, uh, then I may be more likely to uh, push these GA injection drugs um, for these patients. Okay, second to last question. Um, what is the difference between wet and dry AMD? Lots of differences. Um, you know, as I, as I mentioned, um, they're both age-related macular diseases. Most people will have the dry 80 percent with the wet. Uh, dry, they have drusen or age spots. Uh, patients have thinning of the retina and end-stage dry, they have the geographic atrophy. Wet AMD, however, um, is characterized by fluid, wet Fluid. So there is some uh, leakage of fluid either in the retina or underneath the retina because there was a breakdown in what we call the blood retina barrier. So the retina is this very thin translucent tissue in the back of the eye. The layer beneath the retina is called the choroid. The choroid is very densely packed with blood vessels. If there's too much thinning of the retina such that there's a break in that layer between the retina and the choroid, the blood vessels of the choroid break through and start to leak in the retina or um, underneath the retina. And that's when a patient has wet AMD. Even though all wet AMD is considered advanced, as I mentioned, you could have very mild wet AMD, you could have advanced wet AMD. The treatments for dry and wet AMD are different. As I mentioned, um, there are shots for wet AMD, all forms. The dry, only the advanced patients with geographic atrophy are offered injections at this time. Okay, last question, and we're at exactly one hour mark, so I did pretty well with timing. <laughs> okay, is there treatment for dry AMD? Um, yes, there is now treatment. So it, it depends on the stage of dry AMD. So if you have no dry AMD, the treatment is really just have a healthy lifestyle and keep up with your eye exams and stay away from smoking. Early and intermediate, um, well, all types of dry AMD benefit from the lifestyle modifications that I discussed, the smoking avoidance, the active lifestyle. Once you have the advanced dry, 
Bovary or Isurve eye injections. This requires a long, in-depth conversation with your retina specialist about whether you're a good candidate for such a medication. Um, we, we talked a lot about the AREDS2 vitamins, so not necessarily indicated for those with early dry AMD, but if you have intermediate dry or even now advanced dry, you will likely benefit from AREDS2 vitamin. Uh, and that, that's what we have to offer at this time. Uh, however, of course, there's plenty of research in the field. Uh, the big, obviously, uh, you know, area of research that needs to, to be met is, um, well, those who have lost vision already, uh, are, is there a possibility of stem cell transplant? And that is, is still in clinical trials, phase two trials, generally uh, looking at the possibility of, uh, you know, stem cell therapy in order to uh, replace the retina that's been lost to geographic atrophy or to scarring. So uh, hopefully in the future, we'll have more options for our patients. And uh, that's, that's pretty much what I have. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gwaley, for that presentation and for answering those questions for us. Before we move on to the question and answer portion and take a few questions for those online with us today, I do want to again thank Dr. Gwaley for taking time out of her very busy schedule um, to be with us. And again, I encourage anyone here on the line who um, would like to talk to us at Vision Core about our rehabilitation services to help improve your independence and quality of life, please reach out to us uh, through your local case manager um, or if you are not yet working with us at Vision Core, again please reach out to us you may call me directly as well um, again my name is Linda I'm the director of rehabilitation here and my direct phone number is 717-205-4146 This is the end of our webinar. Thank you for joining us. 